Hello everyone, this is Adam Jackson here with the final Cloud Skill Show of 2020. Wow, what a year this has been. Best year ever, right? Um, so before we start today, uh, I just want to to people that haven't been to Cloud Skill Show before, just quickly introduce the show. So this is a weekly live stream. We are live on Learn TV, on Microsoft Developer UK, on Microsoft Developer on Twitch, on all of the other Microsoft channels that agreed to host us uh, at this time every week. Um, and we do ask, as with all Microsoft events, that all of our participants, whether you're a guest on the live chat or whether you're a participant in today's show, have um, take notice of our code of conduct. And it's pretty simple. Uh, be aware of others, be welcoming and respectful to everyone, understanding of each other's differences, friendly and patient, open to all questions and viewpoints, and kind and considerate to others. And I have to say, with some of the wonderful technical topics that we've discussed in this um, this series of the Cloud Skills Show, I'm also asking some of the uh, some of the guests to be um, open to all of my questions because uh, it's uh, you know really opened my eyes to all of the amazing things we can do. But anyway, look, enough from me. Enough from me. Uh, we are going to hand over to our special guest host for today, the wonderful Sarah Lean. Hi, Sarah. Hi Adam, how are you doing? <laughs> Very good, thank you. How's it? How's everything going on your side? Yeah, it's nice. It's yeah. sunny in Scotland today, so um, always, always a positive. That <laughs> you're kidding? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Is it? Is it above zero? Is it above zero? Zero degrees Celsius? I think so. I went out for a walk nice. earlier on, and it was mm. it, it was cold, but it wasn't yeah. unbearable. So, just just yeah. t-shirt weather then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and also joining us today, we have um, Thomas Thornton from who's an Azure specialist. Uh, can I say it? Azure specialist <laughs> at Kanos. <laughs> Hi, How's Thomas. Thanks for joining. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, good. Thanks very much for joining us. So um, I'm going to ask you to both to do like a proper um a, a proper introduction in a moment and then i'm going to disappear off for a little while but i'm going to be about better but um sarah can you tell us about what we can expect on today's cloud skills show yeah so today we're hoping to talk about migrations to azure um using azure migrate as well thomas is going to share some of his learnings from using it with customers um, and we're also going to be talking about hybrid cloud um, and talking about how azure stack and the azure stack portfolio can help you um with that kind of hybrid strategy as well amazing and um uh, we were going to be joined as well, just to say, by uh, by Lisa Clark, uh, who hosts the Lisa at the Edge podcast. Um, really sad she can't join us. Um, um, unfortunate incident with with her cat, I think. Yes, I think I think her and her kitten were playing, and um, unfortunately scratched her eye. So yeah. um, get well soon, Lisa, if you're yeah, tuning wishing, in. <laughs> wishing a very speedy recovery. Um, brilliant. So so let's get some proper introductions from you both. So Sarah, for for people that, that don't know you already, um, what what is your role at Microsoft, and, and what does it entail? Yep, so I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Um, it covers a lot of facets. So one of one of the parts of my job is to create content. So whether that be blogging or videos or doing things like this, um, also collecting feedback from our customers and pushing them back into the engineering teams. The cloud advocate team at Microsoft actually sits in the engineering kind of organization. So we work really closely with the Azure engineering team. So we take all the good and bad feedback around our um, Azure products and push them back into the engineering team to take them on board and hopefully improve things as well. So yeah, that's that's kind of my role in a nutshell. That's amazing. Um, and, uh, and and Thomas, uh, tell us a bit more about what you do at Kianos. Yeah, I'm a technical specialist at Kianos, uh, focusing primarily on all things Azure. So whether that be IaaS, the PaaS, and all the things in between. So yeah, my day to day is, is very different and every day is never going to be the same. So one day it could be IaaS, next day it could be PaaS, and Azure migrate, and then next day it could be Kubernetes. So it's all good fun. and. Definitely enjoyable. That's amazing, and you're you're a technical blogger as well. You've uh, you've got your own website, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, ThomasThornton.cloud. I started that over two years ago now, and yeah, it's, it's been very very popular to be honest. The past year and a half, uh, the stats and views and things like that has definitely increased. And yeah, I, I like to participate to per, or participate within the community as well. So I have a festive tech calendar uh, blog post as well upcoming. So oh, yeah, nice, be sure nice. to check it out. 
Nice name check from the festive tech calendar there as well. I mean, we need a prompt for that. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, um, I, I'm going to disappear off, um, and I know the two of you are going to have a, a bit of a conversation about um, about as you migrate, and um, there's some slides and um, demos as well. But I'll be I'll be back in a little while to hopefully ask a few questions from our audience. And if you are watching and you'd like to um, share your thoughts or use the live chat wherever you are, if you're joining us on Twitch or Twitter or Facebook um, or YouTube, um, just use that live chat or send a tweet to us with hashtag cloud skills and we'll ask you in a little while. Cool, thanks Adam. Um, if Adam, if you wanna pull up my slides, please be my evil assistant on that in the background. Um, so yeah, I want to quickly give you an overview of some of the things you need to think about when you're thinking about moving to Azure from a migration or a hybrid strategy approach. Um, and there's lots of different things that we talk about here at Microsoft. We are very much invested in helping our customers um, make the most of Azure and make it um, a hybrid solution for you. We are investing a lot of time and energy into making it the cloud that our customers want as well. Now, there's lots of different reasons that we are seeing customers move towards a hybrid strategy, whether that be for regulatory or data sovereignty requirements. Lots of customers have requirements where their data has to stay on prem um, or their industry that they're working in hasn't quite got on the bandwagon with cloud and haven't you know, approved it as a place where you can store data. So there are some reasons that people are looking at utilising um, their on-prem infrastructure for some of their workloads, some of their data, and then using the cloud for other functionalities inside the business as well. Other reasons include business continuity and, and the kind of resilience um, that we can offer with cloud. We all know that it's really expensive to host your own data center. It's really expensive to you know rent that building, lease that building, run that building from an e electricity or security point of view. And then on top of that, you have to have the hardware and everything that goes around that, plus the kind of labor intensive hours and making sure all of that equipment is maintained and up to date. Um, and no one likes to pay for something that is sitting doing nothing on the eventuality that something goes wrong with your primary data center. Um, no one likes to do that massive overlay um, outlay that happens with a secondary data center. And that's where Azure and the public cloud can actually come into play because you can leverage that as your secondary site um, and you don't have to invest in all of that massive outlay in terms of your buildings and your hardware. Um, you can just pay for the stuff that you need um, and have that option there if something does go round wrong uh, with your primary data center. However, part of your kind of hybrid strategy will be looking at a migration project. And a migration project can often trigger people thinking about a hybrid strategy. Um, maybe they go into a migration project thinking they're going to move everything up into the cloud. And along the way, they might discover that some things don't belong in the cloud, which is often the case for a lot of our organizations and our customers as well. Now, talking about migrations projects is my specialist subject. You will find me talking about it quite a bit and blogging up quite a bit about it. Um, and I'm a big believer that there's four key stages when you're talking about a migration project. So you've got the discovery phase, which is really looking at and understanding your environment. Now you should all know what your environment looks like. However, there's probably going to be something that you've not documented, something that's been snuck in by someone um, in a temporary measure, or maybe they've put it there and you haven't documented it. So what the discovery phase really does is allow you to audit and fully look at what your environment looks like so as you can understand everything that's there and you understand how everything is interconnected. Because let's face it, your workloads, your servers do not work on their own. Very few servers will be isolated in their own and don't talk to any other servers within your environment. So you need to understand how they all interconnect because if you're going to start to move them, you need to be able to move them as groups and keep them together to make that service that they're providing to your end users or your customers be um, resilient and still available and work the best way forward for them. The discovery phase shouldn't just be about technology, it should be about the people in your organization as well. Lots of people get bogged down in the discovery and they think only about the technology, but you should be leveraging what's happening with your end users, how they access this technology, what it means for them in terms of business criticality and performing their job. And you should also be speaking to the people inside your own IT department. If you're moving all your workloads up into Azure, you need to understand whether they need some support, some training, 
on how to host and run those workloads in Azure. There's no point in you embarking on this project, paying a lot of money for maybe a partner to migrate your workloads up into Azure. And then once that partner leaves, your IT department don't even know how to log on to the Azure portal and maintain everything. So you should be speaking um, to the people within your organization and, and making sure that the technology is also part of the discovery phase. Now, the assessment phase, once you've collected all this data, is the phase where you start to think about what workloads will be migrating to um, Azure um, and what workloads are potentially not suitable for migration and trying to prioritise um, what goes where um, and how you do that. And this is often the stage where people realize that hybrid is probably the way forward for them rather than an all up into the cloud methodology. There's no right or wrong answer, to be honest, um, with this. Um, I'll be, be truly honest with you. Um, lots of people do lift and shift or lift and improve workloads up into the cloud um, as is, as servers, as infrastructure, as service. Um, and there's nothing that you should um, think that's wrong with that. Lots of organizations do that for different reasons. They do it for timeline. They do it for skilling reasons. Um, it just depends. Um, if you want to move everything as PaaS or SaaS um, solutions, that's fine as well. Whatever works for your organization and your workloads is the right answer, to be honest. Now, once you've done all that assessment, you've collected all that data and you understand what the way forward, um, you need to move on to the migration part of your project. And that's the fun part. That's the part where you actually start to use the technology, you start to leverage it and you start to move everything up into the cloud or move some of it up into the cloud. Um, and this is the stage where you should be iterating everything. So you'll start with your um, most non-critical workload, learn from that, move on to the next one, learn from that, move on to the next one. And hopefully by the time you get to your most missing critical application you've learned how to do this and there's no surprises and it is trouble free and you're not getting shouted at by your ceo and um, that something's went wrong now the third the fourth stage sorry or is arguably a stage that'll be peppered throughout your migration project and it'll also become a business as usual activity and that's how you actually run your operations now that they're in the cloud or partially in the cloud. Understand how you need to continually improve your workloads. Maybe you have moved some things as infrastructure as service and you want to move it into um, a, a, a PaaS or a SaaS solution, then that's the time now that you've learned a bit more about the cloud and the platform and you can start to move it up there and um, investigate the best way forward for changing that from IaaS to PaaS or SaaS. Also thinking about continually training your staff. You might have trained them earlier on in your migration project, but the cloud constantly changes and you need to make sure you're constantly investing and in keeping them up to date with their skills as well. Now, the migration project is a fun one, um, but what I'm not suggesting is that you go out there with your paper and your pen and start to collect all this data. There are tools out there that can help you try and have a look at this and collate it and help you understand the best way forward. And that's where Azure Migrate comes in. Now, Azure Migrate is a tool that we've had in our product catalog since 2017. I think a lot of people think it's a fairly new product, but we've had it in our portfolio for the last three or four years. And it's continually grown over those years. It's continually added the features and functionality that people have been asking for. And we've seen a lot of growth around it. It's now the central hub for migrations. We do say that. It is that one-stop shop, that central repository where you can go and see all of your information around discovery and you can also do the migrations. It's not just our products that are in there. We also have leveraged a lot of our third-party products and they are in the Azure portal as part of the Azure Migrate solution as well. So you could leverage someone else's technology and see all the results inside of the Azure portal. So it's that one-stop shop. And it helps you to cover a lot of the scenarios that lots of people are thinking about in terms of their migration. So moving your Windows server, your Linux server, your SQL databases, your raw data that you're storing, your virtual desktops, applications, it can cover all of that. Now, we say that we can migrate um, or assess up to 35,000 servers with that. That's quite a lot. Um, that, that definitely isn't an exercise that you want to be assessing with paper and pen. So Azure Migrate can certainly help you with that. Um, and we can migrate all of your workloads to about 55 regions. Now, I think that figure's probably changed since we've announced lots of new data centers this year. But you have that, that option to move into a lot of our data centers. It's, it's supported quite a bit. 
Now, this is where Thomas is going to come in and um, speak to me in a few minutes about his experiences of Azure Migrate and how it can actually help you with your migration projects. But first of all, let's cover off um, Azure Hybrid. Um, and this is where if you've got to that assessment stage and you've discovered that some of your workloads um, are suitable for staying on prem, how you actually manage them and look after them. Um, we have Azure Arc, which is a fairly new product, which went generally available this year that can help you leverage some of the Azure services that you know and love um, on other servers that don't reside in Azure. So if they live on-prem or if they live in another cloud provider service, you can use Azure uh, Arc to kind of bring those services together and, and be a bit more like that one-stop shop where you can manage everything from one place because you can surface up your servers into the Azure portal if they're Azure Arc connected. Now, Azure Stack is an extension of Azure and is often a solution that lots of people look about and think about um, when they're thinking about the hybrid solution and how they actually implement something on an on-prem environment. In our Azure Stack portfolio, we have Azure Stack Edge, which can help you with things like machine learning at the edge, something I'm not massively familiar with, but I know lots of people that do lots of cool things with Azure Stack Edge. We've also got Azure Stack Hub, which was, um, I think, our first Azure Stack pro product that we released. Um, and that helps you with those disconnected scenarios. Um, maybe if you have, say, an oil rig or a cruise ship that isn't always connected, doesn't have that stable connection, you can use that to try and leverage some of the Azure um, computing power and services as well. And our newest one is Azure Stack HCI, which went generally available a few weeks ago. And that's allowing you to, again, take those Azure services and use them on prem in a familiar way. Azure Stack HCI is definitely something I've been looking at and I'm excited about how we can actually use that within our migration projects and, and extend our hybrid capabilities as well. It's a hyper-converged infrastructure stack that allows you to deliver some Azure services on-prem um, and it's a familiar operating system. It's built on Windows Server. Now, it doesn't have all the components of Windows Server in there, so you'll be missing things like the fax server. Um, but let's face it, that's not the features and functionalities that we want from our kind of virtualization or hosting platform. It will have that familiar um, Hyper-V environment, and we can start to leverage Azure Stack at the man um, sorry, Azure Arc at the management plane within Azure Stack HCI to actually help us manage all of this and to help us manage with the deployments. Now, I had a chance to talk to someone who knows a bit more about Azure Stack HCI recently in an episode of Azure Unblogged. So definitely check that out and you can find out more information about the Azure Stack HCI solution. Now, I want to welcome Thomas back to the show. So thank you for sitting patiently while I spoke there, Thomas. <laughs> no worries. Um, so I know you've been doing lots of migration projects with customers um, and we've talked before about how you've used Azure Migrate. Could you share a bit about your experience around um, Azure Migrate, please? Yeah, uh, Azure Migrate, as you mentioned, uh, it pretty much covers all things uh, migrations within our if you want to migrate into Azure. So the experiences I sort of have is taking the customer from from their are starting their cloud journey and ending up in Azure, and also customers who are familiar with Azure and want to migrate from, say, one of their on premise data centers into Azure. So it, it really is a mixture of both them, Azure Migrate and all the tool sets uh, cater for both, uh, both sides of the, the sort of fence. And <clears throat> I suppose from that as well, it has its own, our, there's quite common challenges within that. So, as you mentioned, uh, understanding the applications across the whole estate. So, uh, whether that be from app to app or if it's a simple three a three tier application that has been there for some time documentation or various things may have uh, it may have changed over time so and uh, having dependencies and understanding them dependencies is is quite key and also as well uh, cost cost is definitely essential uh, all parties want to know about cost from pretty much from day one from day one before you, you even migrate so at the very start if you're sort of migration, all right, the thought of migrations, you want to understand the cost. And then <coughs> suppose as well, uh, when you have uh, when you have a number of virtual machines as well, uh, sitting in say, a data center, and you really need to understand, can these actually be migrated? And uh, this is where uh, Azure Migrate is, is definitely helpful for M3 things alone. So uh, understanding the sort of application process with dependencies uh, is cost and sort of cost over Per year and things like that, and the app or that migration readiness as well. 
which is uh, you could be running some sort of third-party application on a virtual machine, which you bring it into Azure. Uh, I, I will not, I will not like this or backend or something like that. So it's just good to know that up front. Do you see organizations using Azure Migrate before they've even fully committed to doing a migration project um, to do some of that, dis that um, discovery kind of cost analysis? Or is it something that customers only leverage once they've actually committed to a migration project? No, 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 definitely. I think definitely from the, the Scorpio phase, Azure Migrate is, is wonderful. Uh, there's so much data that you can that you can produce from that. And I know in our email exchange recently, I said data is beautiful, which it is. So you have so much data to pretty much use and utilize and view. And but within Azure Migrate, if you're just interested in discovery, uh, you can run, you can just pretty much set it up and out of the box, there's so many sort of graphs and various areas you can look at and run assessments from. and you can pretty much understand straight away, is this going to be worthwhile or if it's going to go maybe hybrid or something like that, you can migrate various applications into the cloud. I think as well, when you're talking to customers that haven't maybe committed to a migration project, the price point of Azure Migrate, which is free, yeah. <laughs> is often a good is, is a good selling point, to yeah, be honest. Definitely. You know, there's there's yeah. minimum effort, there's maybe someone's time and um, in, in, in putting it in place, but it, it's free. So it's, it's a great starting point yeah. if you haven't committed um, if, or if people are not convinced about it. Yeah, also with it being free, I think it's feasibility as well. It's, it's very easy to set up and have things uh, pretty much going from day one and understanding and getting the scorpion assessment set up. And it really is pretty much, you can near run it sort of out of the box in theory. So it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely great. Although I, I probably should highlight that when you are looking at a, a, a kind of assessment or migration tool, you need to think it, I always say three points, Thomas, and I don't know if you're maybe the same, but the price point of the tool itself, um, yep. how you actually implement it, does it require agents, does it, does it require ports open, et cetera? Yep. And lastly, where it actually um, stores that discovery data. With Azure Migrate, it pushes all that discovery data back up into the cloud. And if an organization hasn't quite grasped the benefit of the cloud or approved it from a security point of view, pushing that data up into the cloud can be a bit scary for them and can be a deal breaker. So I always say, look at the price point of the tool itself. How does it actually gather the data and where does it store the data? Do you find customers forget about that? Maybe when they're looking at something like a, a discovery tool first off or um, is it just my customers that are doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think from the discovery phase, uh, the, the customers, uh, they, sometimes they, they might not understand that it's actually going to be sitting in Azure, the data going to be sitting in Azure from from having the discovery rather than sitting on the appliance. So yeah, I think we have discussed in Azure. Or definitely from the early days and understanding where the data is going to sit at any one time. Cool. Um, we've got a question from one of our viewers, Thomas. I don't know if yeah. you want to ask this. If an organization is looking to evaluate their IT uh, environment now, where's the best place to start with that discovery or that uh, evaluation? Yeah, I think from, well, <laughs> from the initial discovery, uh, virtual machine assessment, I think it's definitely a great, a great starting area to look at uh, once you've sort of agreed that you want to think about migrating into the cloud or migrating into Azure. Uh, yeah, so looking at sort of virtual machine assessment, uh, it's it's definitely a great a great tool within Azure Migrate. So uh, the virtual machine assessment, it is three main areas, uh, or three main sort of functions. The first one is calculate Azure readiness. Is this virtual machine, are these sets of virtual machines, are they going to be ready to go, in, to go into Azure? And then things like the sizing recommendations, so that falls into cost. So straight away, you can you can get to understand uh, the costing perspective and following up the third one would, would be your sort of monthly costs. And also as well, uh, from the assessment side of things, there, you can, there's two areas. So performance-based or as it is on-premise. As it is on-premise, it'll pretty much lift uh, the sizing and say storage and things as it is on-premise or if you're thinking or something different performance-based. So over, over, over a matter of weeks or days, I can pretty much have an assessment for you to recommend the virtual machine sizing and storage and networking things like that to go in user. So that will help actually better from a better cost cost perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all probably guilty, or at least I was when I was managing on-prem environments, Thomas, of 
putting too many resources on some of my servers because I was frightened <laughs> that it wouldn't perform correct. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's very true. <laughs> um, so it's key when you're moving those workloads up into Azure, you move them as a the right size because on-prem you've already paid for that investment, right? You've you've splashed the cash maybe three years ago and you've bought all this expensive hardware so you can use it. You use yep. it as you, as you want. Um, but when you move into the cloud, you're paying for that on an hourly or a daily or a monthly basis. So if you've overscaled your workloads, you're paying for that and you're going to see the cost suddenly at the end of the month on your credit card yeah. bill or your subscription yeah. bill. So right sizing is, is is a massive exercise that a lot of organizations um should be going through. Do you do you see that with a lot of your workloads that you're you're migrating that right sizing can actually be a bigger challenge convincing them maybe to downsize some of their resources? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. So uh, downsizing resources sometimes uh, can be easier said than done in, in some aspects sometimes. Uh some backends and SQL servers could be sized uh, a few years ago, and they've, they've been going ever since. Or in that fashion, so trying to get customers and things to think about downsizing that can be can be tricky. But uh, from the sort of performance based assessments and things that Azure Migrate provides, it's a it's definitely a handy tool for them sort of discussions. So thinking about some of the workloads people have in their environment. Um, I know some of my um, friends and previous colleagues are still running some of the older legacy operating systems. So Windows Server 2003, there's some Windows Server 2008 in there. Um, are you discovering that with a lot of customers and how do you tackle that? Are you just moving them as is up into Azure and taking advantage of some of the offers we have there? Or are you upgrading them or changing them before you move them into Azure, Thomas? Yeah, so I suppose that depends on the customer and depends, say, on the application. If it's a server 2003 application, sometimes it it mightn't it mightn't be as easy to migrate that to a to say a server 2012 or something like that. And then that's, that's where the discussion would start. Uh, how how to get this workload in the Azure? So things like a Hyper V maybe sitting in Azure, or just a virtual machine sitting in Azure and having them set of virtual machines within that, depending on many virtual machines there is or. Yep the size of the application sometimes it could just be a, a web and a web front end and just a simple back there to go back in you could have that sitting inside uh, hyper-v and inside user and the networking things like that is is quite straightforward to get communication to and from as well yeah i, I do love that you can do nested virtualization inside azure yeah. i have some labs set up like that um in azure and it's 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 super easy and it saves me having to have something sitting in my office. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. nested virtualization is, is awesome. Yeah. awesome. In terms of some of the older operating systems, specifically thinking about Windows Server 2008, we have, um, like I said, some features and functionality in Azure that allows you to take that up into Azure and still get security updates and maybe using Azure Hybrid Benefit so you can get some cost savings. Is that are those offers maybe driving some customers to move some of their legacy operating systems up into the cloud, or is that something that you guys are trying to convince them to do um, at Kainos? Yeah, I think from that perspective, it would be it would depend on each customer as well. Uh, some customers may want to just keep it as it is and say for the end of life support and things like that. The additional end of life support once it moves in, those are definitely a great selling point. And then some customers may want to migrate to it or try and uh, migrate that application into a later operating system. So it really depends on the customer and there's a there's a mixture of both. Cool. Um, now, I think I mentioned it in my presentation about lifting and shifting, Thomas. Are you one of the people that think it's a lift and shift migration or lift and improve? Or where do you sit on that fence on that one? <laughs> uh, I, I probably sit in the middle, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lifting and shifting is great. Uh, pretty much taking IaaS VMs into Azure as as VMs, but then uh, lifting and then sort of modernization as well, moving some workloads maybe into SQL servers, for example. Uh, within Zero Migrate, it can have recommendations that go straight to PaaS. So Azure SQL or Azure SQL Managed Instance. And also as well, I think within Azure is awesome, things like network security groups. So uh, these massive are firewall, firewall appliances that currently sit uh, on-premise, you can uh, some of the time you can bring them across and have them say as uh, network security groups and if you want something uh, more or uh, with more features uh, Azure Firewall so utilizing the sort of Azure resources as well so discussions along the way uh, 
no, not bringing everything. So that's where I sit sort of on the fence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's so many Azure resources which can be utilized uh, during a, a migration as well. So network security, yeah. Azure firewall, and then building your landing zone, uh, things like that. Yeah, I think even the introduction of Azure Auto Manage, which is a preview service yeah. that we launched at Ignite, can actually help customers or maybe the smaller customers um, launch their virtual machines into Azure and then add on all the capabilities um, like monitoring, patch updates, auto shutdown, all of that, and help them manage that as well and give them actual additional functionality they've never had on prem. Yeah. Um, have you have you used the Auto Manage um, yet, Thomas? Uh, just on my sort of uh, lab. Or and we haven't used it uh, within a customer environment. But uh, also as well, I think things like application insights and log analytics is awesome. Uh, sometimes are, you, you would see it uh, more often, app insights, things like that. Uh, customers would see data that they haven't really saw before and ingesting mm -hmm. that and configuring that within the customer's applications can bring more and more data and they can understand their applications actually uh, sometimes better and see more data and making uh, sometimes faster improvements as well with all that data that is readily available. Cool. Um, going back to Azure Migrate for a minute here, Thomas, you shared yep. a great resource with me about um, how to learn Azure Migrate. I think you said there's a lab or something that people yeah. can utilize. Yeah, there's, there's, there's pretty much a whole, uh, as a whole workshop sort of thing. Uh, and then there's the Microsoft Learn as well that I saw in, in one of your documents at pretty much if it's a single user, you can you can run through a, a quick lab, and then moving over to that sort of cloud lab workshop, which is pretty much a Hyper-V setup, and you bring that you can bring that into Azure, set it up in Azure, so you can see how nested virtualization works in Azure, and then from there you can look at migrating that across uh, using Azure Migrate. Awesome, and um, that's definitely something I think I've leveraged in the past to learn about Azure Migrate or do some demos and and set up that environment. Um, yep. Now, unfortunately, I was going to be grilling Lisa about some Azure Stack questions, and she's not here. So, Thomas, <laughs> I'm going to be talking to you about Azure Stack. Have you been using Azure Stack with any of your customers? Have you have you done any implementations? No, uh, Azure Stack is not something I've <laughs> I've put on to be honest. <laughs> so, um, uh, from the questions side of things, uh, we, do we you, do you have conversations with customers about it? Do, when you're talking about the migration up into Azure, do they do some of them say, oh, I'm not going to the cloud, but I'm happy with Azure Stack? Is there a misconception or some conversations that happen around that, Thomas? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, nowadays sort of thing, uh, bringing into the cloud is, is more and more spoken about. Uh, if, everywhere you look, so things like Office 365, a lot of customers will have it. Office package of some sort, and it must likely be Office 365 nowadays. And so from there, uh, a lot of their applications are currently, in theory, sitting in the cloud. So that's you're pretty much bringing uh, further applications and taking them and putting them into the cloud. So that leverages that sort of part. And then uh, Azure Stack, not so much, uh, to be honest. <laughs> um, Lisa's so, actually just pinged me and she's, yeah. she's she's given me something to read out so people I'm just going to read this cool. out from what Lisa says um, she says the biggest misconception of Azure Stack portfolio is that it's for people who don't want to use the cloud but what it's for is people who do want to use Azure but can't for some reason like I said earlier on that data sovereignty um, issue that they may have with some of the workloads and she's also said that Azure Stack is truly consistent with Azure I think when you look at like Azure Stack Hub the management interface is identical to the Azure portal. So if you're leveraging Azure portal and you know how to use that, Azure Stack should be quite an easy adoption because you should be familiar with the portal as well. And obviously, as I said earlier on, the Azure Stack HCI is built on Windows Server technology as well. So if you've been using Windows Server, then you should be able to navigate your way and set up around um, Azure Stack HCI. Um, so yeah, um, there's lots to talk about. Hopefully we can get Lisa back on the show next year. Um, Adam will have me back on the Cloud Skills show and we can have a chat with Lisa about the Azure oh, Stack. Oh, uh, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think there's another question in the chat here, Thomas, and I wanted to see what your um, thoughts are on this. Um, what do you see as the trends or challenges for organizations in 2021? Yeah, uh, trends and challenges. To be honest, I think moving from IaaS and in the past and probably a sort of containerization and running containers, things like that, I think will be the sort of challenges and be looked at further. It's just being looked at more and more. So I, I can see that definitely continuing and 
try taking some workloads and maybe containerizing them or moving them into <laughs> not necessarily uh, Kubernetes, maybe web apps, things like that. Something uh, quite lightweight, and then depending on your on your stack, uh, possibly Kubernetes as well. Yeah, I think I did a kind of um, random ask me anything with two of my colleagues yesterday, Thomas and Pierre, and I think we all listed containers as something we were all going to have to learn in 2021 yeah. um it's something i've, I've if i'm all, being honest i've ignored until now um but i think like you say it, it's a trend that people are starting to look at it it's not necessarily the answer to everybody's problems no. um but it's definitely something I, I need to have a look at and and, and learn a bit more about because i definitely don't know enough um is it something you use regularly thomas in your day-to-day -day job yeah uh with my current the dead or the project that i'm Currently on the past few weeks, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, all things Kubernetes at the moment. Uh, the past couple of weeks, so it's yeah, it's, it's definitely been great and um, containerizing and things like that. But as you mentioned, all things definitely cannot be containerized. So, as uh, so a lot of time, it would require some sort of rewrite. So maybe moving to something pass. So pretty much uh, meeting halfway in the bridge, uh, depending as well if you're looking at migrations and and uh, a lot of the time migrations some. Or have a time sort of time scale, so requiring a rewrite or part of a rewrite in the middle of that uh, mightn't be the, the greatest if I do. So trying to pretty much utilize uh, pad services, I think, and then halfway, and then maybe looking at containerization in the next in the next setup. Adam, have you got any questions for us? Have well, I, I, actually, I was I was going to say. I mean, I, my so my previous job. Um, in Microsoft before I moved over to um, you know work with technical communities was working with uh, Microsoft partners and sp uh, specifically it was um, ISV so soft you know um, part Microsoft partners that are building their own software um, and a lot of those had really been pioneers from you know the very early days of Azure and um, and they'd um, you know before Azure Migrate even came along and what you'd see over and over again and I think that people are still still not always taking the advice is um they, they um they just weren't keeping up to date and you alluded to this um and it, it wasn't even just as it wasn't even as complex as they haven't begun the, the journey from um infrastructure to platform as a service but sometimes it was they'd you know they deployed all of their vms and they just left them they hadn't even checked the cost they hadn't even looked at the your calculator to see are, are, yeah. am i on the most efficient <laughs> vm am i on one that's costing me an absolute fortune and um yep. you, you know we used to work with them and i used to get into terrible trouble because um you know i'd um, i'd be working with a you know a, this 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 wonderful company and you know the next quarter their bill would go down and my manager <laughs> would say what did you do you know did you annoy them i said no i actually talked them through how to optimize their environment <laughs> of course their their bill went down and that's actually you know it's a um that's actually really what, what we want you know we want we want people to have a really efficient and optimized environment and we don't want as microsoft we don't want to always to be the people that say actually we're actually taking this vm away because it's sort of like several generations old and now the the underlying infrastructure is archaic so um, i would say to everyone even just as a really basic thing are you even on the right infrastructure are you doing things in the most cost optimized way you know if you're not ready to go on to uh you know onto containers or um, you know, or, or maybe some of the more advanced platform services. Then just take a look at that, and you could cut quite a substantial portion from your bill. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I love Azure Advisor, even in my own subscription, because it tells me when I've, I've run things too big or I've left things running. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah. shut down as well. So it auto shut down. <laughs> so it your life so many times. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Um, is cost management something your customers um, have to learn how to do, Thomas? Because it's such a different model from that capex to opex model. Yeah, it could cost management, but I think uh, as your advisor, as, as you mentioned, it's definitely the first thing to look at. And uh, out of the box, it does so many uh, notifications and notifies it. It will it'll notify uh, the subscription, or you can you can view straight away uh, sort of cost. And then from there, you can work in cost optimizations and things like that. And then I, I think as well. Uh, as Adam mentioned, the, the very series of virtual machines, uh, every so often there's a different series and it, it's usually cheaper. So as your advisor ingests that and keeps an eye on that as well and uh, sh shutting down services which are not used, uh, say if it's a nine to five application, there's no need to have that application or overnight things like that. So th things like that will definitely uh, 
all fit into cost. And and it's it's great evidence because I know when I was running on prem environments, I know I said I was guilty of oversizing things in the past, but um, when I was trying to fight with say the developers or the database people and say you can shut this down, no one's using it, um, or you're using far too much resources and we could downsize and still get the same performance. Yeah. I didn't really have the information on prem. I didn't have that. It was more a gut feeling or just you know um, me doing some research. Um, but Azure Advisor gives you all of that information. So you actually could, you know, like write it out and send it to them and be like, here's the evidence and they've got no comeback. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much data that, that you can pretty much produce. Um, uh, things like log analytics as well. Uh, it can all be sort of fed into that and run various uh, dashboard or even create Azure dashboards, which are various teams that you can pretty much ingest into the Azure yeah. portal. So straight away, they can see uh, costing or things like that or metrics, whatever metrics is needed. Yeah, I think you said it earlier, and this is probably going to be the catch line for this episode, that data is beautiful and it's <laughs> to a lot of projects. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> is. It really is. You know? yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, that's another area I need to learn more about, big data and how we do some data things in Azure, because that's that's a whole other world. Is that anything, you, have you done anything with that, Thomas, or is it on your to-do list? <laughs> uh, I suppose it's on my to-do list. Uh, we, we think, you know, there's, there's various big data teams which would, would focus in that in that area. I've touched on it, but nothing nothing too intensive. Yeah, <laughs> there's so much to it. I think one of the very first projects that I did ever in Azure was an IoT project, which is to yeah. completely out of my comfort zone. And I had to use things like Stream Analytics and Event Hubs and Power BI, which again was something completely new to me. So um, yeah, there's a whole other world in terms of the big data and the stuff that we can do around that. So I'm I've been guilty of leaving it to other people, but it probably should be on my to-do list to learn. Um, Adam, you're hiding in the background. Are you got, have you got anything on your to-do list this year or next year even um, for learning? Are you keeping yourself technical? Oh, so much, actually, so much. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's, um, yes, it's, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a program manager, um, I sometimes feel that I, um, because I'm so busy sort of organizing things, I sometimes ne neglect it myself. So actually, I, it's it's interesting, you know, the whole, I do this show every week and uh, I was saying to people, you must do this learning path, you must do the certification. I think I should actually really need to do some <laughs> myself. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I am... Um, um, I, I'm more. Um, my interest is more over to the, you know, the sort of IT infrastructure um, side than the development side. Anyway, don't tell anyone else. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, um, actually, this is interesting. I did have a couple of questions on Twitch about sort of certifications mm -hmm. and things like that. And I mean, um, is it is it is it right to say that if people are, uh, you know, thinking about Azure migration and, um, you know, there is an Azure migrate learning path. Um, but in terms of certification, would Azure Fundamentals be the right place to go, or is there something else that people should be thinking about? Um, I think there's a, there's a few, and it will depend on what your role is in your yeah. organization. Like, I think Azure Fundamentals, and, and correct me, Thomas, if I'm wrong here, but I think it's one for everybody within yeah, the organization. It, yeah, it would be sort of your foundation with any Microsoft certification, and if you're, or sorry, not Microsoft Azure certification, and if you're new to Azure, it's definitely a great learning and great learning paths as well. And then uh, Microsoft Learn, that has been on the screen a few times. It's definitely recommended to have a look in there. There's various learning paths for uh, most certifications now. And yeah, it, it's very, very good. So I would start with your uh, fundamentals, which is I said 900. And depending on the area that you work in or want to specialize in or want to look at, uh, I, I, would, I would go from there. Yeah, I think I certainly encourage the customers I talk to to try and get everybody in their organization to a certain yeah. degree. Um, the fundamentals one, you know, the people in finance that you're having to talk to about CapEx and OpEx. So as they understand some of the terminology and how the cloud works, as well as your boss, who's maybe totally hands off keyboard, so that he or she understands those concepts, as well as the person that is doing the hands on keyboards. I think it's, it's a great exam just to clarify and put everybody at the same level. And then, yep, like Thomas definitely. said, you know, look at some of the administrator ones or the architect ones or the developer or the security um, and, and just build up from there. Um, it really just will depend on your job role um, as well. Um, I think, have you, you, you're you big into certifications, Thomas, haven't you? You've done hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've done a few. I've done <laughs> what's, what's on your to-do list? Have you got a certification you're working on at the moment? Uh, to be honest, it was... Uh, 
to pretty much uh, I've got the architect certificate, so I was I was looking to pretty much uh, recertify, but that is all changed now as well. So yeah, yeah, it, it was actually meant to be two weeks ago, and then it got pushed back with uh, COVID and things like that, an extra six months extension, and now the, the sort of recertification has changed again. So. Yeah, I'm excited to see what that recertification is because mine were due to expire in January um, and I've obviously got an extension but it'll be exciting to see what happens in February because I think it's February we're announcing and showing the material about how you recertify yeah. which has completely changed um, so yeah, definitely keep an eye on that um, it'll be an eye the opener cost, and cost change on that as well, wasn't there? Is it, it, yes, it, it, so uh, recertifying is going to be free um, oh. you'll have to pay for their initial exam I believe um, and that'll be valid for one year instead of two years now but your recertification will be part of Microsoft Learn and it'll be entirely free for you to recertify every year so um, it'll definitely be exciting to see what that does and um, I'll be champing at the bit to recertify <laughs> <laughs> when I can yeah, yeah it'll, it'll be good <laughs> and I know that if um, if people are um, um, you know uh, looking for work if you've been impacted by COVID if you've been furloughed or um, or you're looking for work you can actually get a very substantial discount off your first exam um, I think that's around $15 obviously it varies on where you are in the world so I think you just need to go to Microsoft Learn um, and the details on the website somewhere there but that's um, that I think you know that we were talking before we came on on air um, as usual today about you know the the um, you know the, the the way things are going, and uh, you know I was talking to one of my colleagues about the economy, um, and you know it's um, you know we all know that there's uh, you know that more people are looking for work, but actually there's still a lot of jobs in the areas that we talk around on the Cloud Skills Show in you know in IT operations in um, in software development, and my you know migration is a big part of that, and companies are thinking about. Uh, you know what their next investment is going to be. I mean, we had you know certainly in March, um, everyone panicked all of a sudden and thought, do we need to put you know everything on the cloud? You know, how do people reach things? And we had that initial flurry, and now people are starting to think, well, you know, we're not going to go all the way back to the way we were to having everyone in the office. How do we use the cloud to um, extend um, things? You know, we might not want to get rid of that the um, the whole data center. Um, you know, we, we actually want to keep our investment, but how do we use that to extend? And it's, you know, on top of the things that you've talked about today, I think there's, you know, there's lots of, um, I guess that's maybe a good question to ask, actually. I mean, you know, if um, if people, you know, are really happy with the data center app seat as it is, what's like the, what's the sort of the, the biggest wins you can get um, from, um, from Azure? And I heard someone talking recently about, Active Directory is your Active Directory, um, and that being something that would be really helpful to um, to folks that maybe you know they don't need to migrate to the cloud, but they're thinking about how can how can something like Azure actually help them today. So how how does that actually work? What would the benefits be there? Thomas, you want to take that question because you probably have to answer it for your customers <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, as Active Directory, uh, with for, from the application perspective. Uh, it handles so many various ways of authentication, so B2B and uh, business to business and B2C. So straight away out of the box, there's so many sort of APIs that the customer can leverage and without any recoding uh, can work on straight away. And also as well, I think uh, moving in things like into Azure, uh, the past services, so again, uh, SQL, without the, without the customer having the, maybe the managed their SQL workloads now, they can use uh, the PaaS version, Azure SQL. So out of the box, there's no need for patching these big uh, virtual machines and things like that, which is definitely a good selling point. And then for the front ends at uh, web apps. So if you're looking to move into a PaaS world and th that mitigates things like patching uh, security vulnerabilities and mm -hmm. along the lines of that. And then also as well, uh, moving all things into sort of Azure uh, hybrid benefit and uh, licensing. So there's, if you have a, if you have a package with Microsoft, there's there's cost uh, benefits and things like that as well. And then uh, as well, there's there's various Azure resources which out of the box uh, you can use for your applications which don't need an actual uh, rewrite and things like that. So again, I mentioned the application insights. So that's depending on your application, you can feed that in quite easily into your app and have so much more statistics as well. But then again, oh sorry. Yeah, so that hybrid hybrid benefit one was um, the, that I think that was um, 
that can make quite a big difference to the costs that you actually pay. And it's yep. something that that's something for um, for customers that are already have Microsoft licenses with software assurance. So if you have um, Windows or SQL Server, um, you know, check your you know check obviously check with the, the, your licensing provider to see whether you have the correct licenses. But you can save. I think this this page. This is actually one of your blogs, Sarah, isn't it? So um, um, it, it, you can say 40% with a hybrid benefit. Um, and then actually, if you reserve the instances, which means you sort of block commit over a one to three year period, then you can save even more. So that can really mm. substantially bring down the price. Yep. And it's it's not just for Windows now. We announced at Ignite this year that it's also Linux as well. We've got some programs with some of the, the Linux providers. Um, so you can use use some of the licensing or software subscription. I think they call it something different um, in the Linux world. But there's there's certainly hybrid benefit for Windows um, and SQL and some of the Linux ones as well. So definitely dig into that and see if you can leverage that. Because, again, it could be massive cost savings around that as well. Amazing. Um, one of the um, I remember having a conversation um, recently with um, um, actually Sarah, one of um, one of your colleagues, uh, Sonia, um, mm -hmm. about what's like one, what's one of the most basic things that um, the cloud can fix, and she said password resets, um, <laughs> which I thought was a, a really intriguing one. But it seems to be like one of the problems that the pandemic has thrown up is that because people can't go to that little IT hatch anymore. And uh, you know, and, and ask them to sort out their password. Um, they, um, you know, th there's more of a. It's become more apparent that people need to be able to um, reset their passwords, and that, that's one of the things you can really easily do with Azure Active Directory. Sonia was telling me that um, you know, but just by implementing that, by connecting that to your existing Active Directory, you can um, spin up that um, self-service um, password reset. And um, and actually, it's, it's really interesting because I thought, well, that's you know, that that's cute, but it's it's that's actually very <laughs> basic. But actually, it's a huge time saver, saves quite a lot of money, and um, and probably actually, um, you know, a, a lot of patience with with people. You know, certainly, you know, sort of the days oh, yeah. of grabbing your computer and driving to the office when it didn't work. <laughs> we we need to get past that. So think about those little wins that we can uh, we can get just by using services where they where they make sense. Oh yeah, because. I remember I did my first job out of university was on an IT help desk and um, roll round, you know, like the 4th of January when everybody came back after the two weeks, we would be getting slammed with calls of, I've forgotten my password, what's yep. my password? And like, <laughs> the first like three hours of that day back would be resetting passwords. So even just implementing those kind of self-service um, types of things are, are, are really great savers. Um, and this is a time if you haven't you know, send out that annual email and tell people where that self-service um, tool is that you have in your organization because it will stop the calls when everybody comes back yeah. on, to work on the 4th of January. So yeah, <laughs> there's no point in implementing these tools in your environment and not communicating them to your staff. So make sure you're you're spamming them with the information about the self-service password reset tool. <laughs> I know that uh, I know that Satya Nadella is on a mission to like, you know, abolish passwords. So I'm still yeah, I'm still hoping. <laughs> and use a password. Use a password manager as well. Oh, if yeah. you have a different password for everything, use the password manager. You need to remember one. So I, I regularly forget my work password now. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm just looking. I mean, you know, uh, questions. You know, the, sort of more questions about you know certifications, which I think we we've answered. Um, someone actually, <laughs> a slightly different question. Um, someone on Twitch wants to know what chair. Um, that is that you're using, Thomas. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually a new chair. It's an Ergo chair too. Nice. So it's, it's very, it's very comfortable to us. You can <laughs> you can lean well back, which I'll not demo on the call. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you can you can lean, yeah, it's, it's very very good. If, yeah, I've I've had it now a uh, couple of weeks and very very good. That's great. Awesome. Yeah, don't don't forget your posture. We did uh, we did just <laughs> yoga. Earlier in the week, if uh, if um, anyone caught that on festive tech calendar, that was on Tuesday. So, uh, yes, don't forget your, the healthy desk, nice standing desk, good chair. If you you know if you can get, it. I, I I want a standing desk. I don't have one, but uh, I, I need to be on my feet a bit more. But uh, but there we go. <laughs> um, I, I think oh. that we're almost out of time. I don't know if there are any sort of final questions that that people had. Um, I wanted to help Thomas um, amplify something that he's doing next year. Thomas, could you tell us what the Azure Spring Clean is all about? Yeah, Azure Spring Clean, it's a community event and it's pretty much focused on 
uh, cleaning up your Azure uh, subscription. So things from security to policy to looking at say, Azure Monitor more, things like that. And it's, it's myself and uh, Joe Carlisle is, is running that. So it's happening, well, it's scheduled for March. And so from that, it's going to be a five day event with hopefully five blog posts a day. And each day will have a certain topic. So things like Azure policy, uh, Azure security, uh, and then uh, maybe cost things like that to pretty much spring clean and uh, spruce up your environment and uh, look at thing or look at uh, reducing cost and things like that. Awesome. That sounds amazing. I'll definitely have yeah. a look and see if I can help contribute to it, but good yeah. job on doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the last year was, was very good. So this is the, the second year of it running. Awesome. Good stuff. I love community events and stuff like that. I, um, Festive Tech Calendar, Azure Spring Green, amazing, amazing yep. events to kind of drive learning within the community and sharing. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I've loved doing the Festive Tech Calendar this year. I've learned, learned a lot as well as I've been going, having to review all of the, the content. And um, I love... Um, I love these these things that are um, you know uh, th these things like Spring Clean and Festive Tech Calendar because it's actually put together by the Azure technical community for the community. So there's no marketeers. There's there's none <laughs> of that. It's just pure tech goodness from people that really care. And we all need to Spring Clean. I I probably need to clean up my Azure subscription as well. I always do every few months. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Cool. Well, um, huge thank you again to being on this week's show and, uh, you know, it's the last one of 2020. So, um, you know, thank you for being with us. So um, thank you, Thomas. And obviously, everyone, make sure to sure. check out Thomas on Twitter as well. Um, this is Twitter handle. And as your spring clean as well, let's just bring that link up one more time. And um, thank you to Sarah as well. Um, mm -hmm. So um, really, you know, um, really appreciate you being on the show. Um, I think you've you've committed yourself to doing another one because you said that we're going to try and bring Lisa <laughs> on again. So <laughs> so we'll look out in series three or four for that. Um, awesome. But we're going to take a few weeks break now on um, Cloud Skills Show for the festive period. And we're going to be back, I think, on the 14th of January. Don't know what the topic's going to be yet, so look out for it. Um, but um, you know, make sure to keep watching um, Festive Tech Calendar, uh, keep watching Learn TV, keep subscribing to all of the wonderful communities, follow everyone on Twitter. You can learn so much. And you know, we, we all need something to keep us busy this winter. So uh, you know, um, make sure you follow up on some of those things. Everything from today is going to be on this blog post, ak.ms forward slash C. I know it's a bit of a bit long, CS dash S2 E9. Um, but I will tweet about it. So find me on Twitter if you um, if you want, and uh, I will be posting the link in just a few minutes. But just a final thank you to the guest today. It was absolutely great to learn more about um, as you're my great and hybrid. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you both again very soon. Cool. Thank cool. you, Adam. Thanks Talk very soon. much. Cheers. Cheers. See you soon. <laughs>